Hey guys, my name is Raj. My full name is Nataraj in Sabaya. I walked into a Starbucks uh, coffee shop 10 years ago, walked out with a shorter name. Um, now, I managed uh, two of the product teams uh, at Yelp. The search team all search like, the recommendations, the search uh, ML algorithms, the UX that goes along with it. And then the transactions team, like Yelp's trying to become the marketplace for all the local places, all the, you know, the local search results. Uh, so both of those teams is something I manage on the product side. <clears throat> I've been with Yelp for close to three and a half years now. And before that, I was at Microsoft for a little bit. At Microsoft, I worked at Bing, uh, where uh, I own local search there as well. And then also the knowledge graph, as we know it. Uh, you know, with how Google, Google is super famous about putting the task pay on the right. That's something we worked on in, in Bing, believe it or not. Um, and, the, uh, and before that, I had my own startup. Uh, part of the reason why I moved from being a, uh, an engineer into product management, I did everything that I could, everything wrong that I could with, uh, at my startup, and the hardest problems were always trying to figure out uh, what to work on and how to make something more successful. So that kind of like pushed me into product management more seriously. Um, this was back in, you know, back at a time when product management was not as sexy as being a, an engineer. Everyone who was an engineer wanted to be an engineer. And then people who failed being engineers became product managers. I think tides have, sh have shifted a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like a quick high level overview of uh, who I am and what I do. And I figured for today's talk, instead of me telling you what I want to tell you, maybe we kick off this, uh, this discussion by you guys asking me what you want to know. And then we can take it from there. Does that sound good? Okay, great. I know. <laughs> yeah, please. Hi, Raj. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming here. I'm really interested to learn more about your experience. I've learned that, in my experience, that product managers are very results and specifically metrics focused. Right. So, in the various products that you've worked on, can you talk about a little bit about what were the metrics you chose to focus on the most and how you chose those metrics over other metrics that have, you know, it's around? Right. Um, I think. I think it's a very great question. It's a really good question. It's, it's a hard question so because you can answer that in different layers. Uh, let me start off with search, uh, for that matter. Um, the metrics I would choose depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to, say, the SVP of the, the org, uh, I think he would care less about my operational metrics, which are things like you know um, CTR, or user happiness, or side by side, how we compete with other people in the in the area. Uh, and if I'm talking to uh, uh, someone who's operationally on the team, uh, say my reports, or say the operational team, I actually would talk about all these these specific metrics because that's where we run our AB experiments against. Um, so, but let, the, the, if I'm, if it comes a time where I have to choose between metrics, it, I guess what I'm saying is, is the purpose defines what metrics I choose. Uh, if I'm running an experiment and I want to figure out which metrics to choose, then I would try and choose the most sensitive metrics that I can measure for that specific experiment. Uh, if I'm talking to a person who cares more about the business as opposed to what experiments I'm running, then I tend to choose the high level metric. Um, one good place that I recently started uh, uh, one good technique that we recently started using that I think is might be useful is, uh, especially in the latter side, if you if you talk to some of someone in C suites or people who are on the business side of your uh, company, then uh, start off with something super high level. Like you know, if the one question you can ask is, hey, if you were to talk to a hundred of your users and you had one question to ask them, and that question needs to be constant, what is that one question you'd ask? For search, it could be any number of things. How happy are you, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the, the yes or no answer, uh, yes or no question that I'd want to ask for those 100 people are like, do you use this search engine or not, right? And that ends up being the true not star metric for someone who's interested in the business side. Um, and then on the, on the operational side, um, you know, how soon can you, quick, how quickly can you measure and how accurately can you measure it? And how representative is that metric um, for what you really want to measure. His, uh, based on my experience, the metrics have never been the problem uh, because there are enough people in the room who are smart enough to point out 
that you're measuring the wrong things, right? There are enough engineers in the room who are like, hey, you're measuring the wrong thing. It's how we measure it and what we use it for. That's always been the problem. Uh, a lot of the times, especially on the operational side, I've, what I've seen is um, people come up with what to measure after they ship the experiment. Confirmation bias kicks in all the time. Oh, that's great. I'm only going to measure these three things because I expected those three things to move and it moved positively. I'm going to ship it. So that's mostly been the problem. That's what I've, you know, I try and guardrail against as opposed to choosing which one. I don't think I answered your question exactly, but hopefully it's an answer and the summary is useful. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, so could you pick any product that you worked on on PM? Right. 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 Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so, thankfully, most of the things I worked on so far have all been newish products. Um, the the one thing I'm really happy about was uh, creating this this transactional um, team slash feature area instead of Yelp. So. Yelp's known for a lot of things. Uh, when you first think of Yelp, you think about content consumption. Okay, this is where I want to go to decide which place to go to. That's, that's it, right? Uh, it's really hard to change the mindset of users unless you, you, you put some, some, a lot of force behind it in terms of marketing or in terms of actually changing the product itself. So uh, we have this philosophy of uh, you know, crawl, walk, run. So uh, what we tried doing uh, for when we wanted to create a transactional marketplace is that we talked to external people who are trying to build these marketplaces uh, outside of Yelp, and then we worked with them. We became a partner, and we, um, um, you know, basically we become a marketplace for local uh, for local transactions. Uh, the the challenge there was: can we use the existing demand on Yelp? to actually solve for one side of the marketplace problem, which is demand. Uh, the, we've, we've, we tried it for six to eight months. We didn't see any signal that that was actually happening. Um, and then, you know, that, that was a problem that I got. Uh, and then I worked on it for a lot, the last uh, year and a half, two years. And we were, able, we were able to like make some pro progress there. And I think part of the, uh, the first steps that we did there was, you know, I'm a big fan of Tiger Teams. So I think I'm going to go very tactical at this point. I'm a big fan of Tiger Teams, making sure that I always think that solutions are always a combination of problems and people. So I tried creating a Tiger Team that worked on that specific problem, that thought about that problem day and night, and went to bed thinking about the problem, woke up thinking about the problem, uh, and it was small. Uh, and we were okay taking risky bets. A lot of the times we ship things that if my, you know, my boss found out that we shipped, he'd probably be like, hey, what the hell are you doing? But we still ended up you know, just testing it out. Um, uh, and the, 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 the way we worked there was we tried, um, we tried testing the extremes of things to see which direction we need to go in. Um, so meaning uh, if, if, we, if people don't come to Yelp and look for delivery, uh, how do we actually get them to do that, right? Um, and then that needs to be, the, you can take small steps, one small step at a time, but if your intent is just to test it, the, you want to make the loudest noise and, and get, you know, move the, uh, the needle as much as you can with the lowest effort. So we ended up testing very uh, aggressively on, on trying to move the needle, figuring out like, which needles you need to move. I need people first, we need people to search for delivery. Uh, then we need to make sure we have the right uh, and the right supply, and then we need to make sure we're, we're actually matching uh, demand to supply, and then making sure there's like enough of a liquidity point for people to want to work with us. So heavy prioritization on what needles to move on first, and then trying out louder experiments to see if you can actually move the needle. And if things didn't work, we dropped it, moved on to other things. The positives and negatives to that approach, but that worked for us. Yeah, please. Right. Right. Um, sorry. Yeah, that that is a little bit of marketplace jargon. Um, so, 
when you're building a marketplace, there are two, two sides of the equation. One is demand, the other is supply. Um, this is, so demand could be uh, you looking, you as a user are looking to order food. Uh, supply could be restaurants that let you order food through, say, Yelp. Um, the, to, for a marketplace to grow, it's, it's kind of a cyclical relationship. Uh, the, for the marketplace to grow, you kind of need to match supply to demand. That's like the you know, marketplace one-on-one. And liquidity is an event where once you hit that point, it's a theoretical point, once you hit that point, uh, your growth in demand and growth in supply is going to go up. Growth in demand because you have enough supply for people to find this to be very useful, and growth in supply because you're, in, you're contributing to enough percentage of your revenue, or this is important enough that I can't really ignore. In this case, if I own a restaurant and 50% of my revenue comes from online ordering systems, I'm not going to turn it off. I'm not going to go off the platform. If only 10 orders, like I get 10 orders a month from, from e, uh, E24 and I get you know, customer call services all the time, I'm going to turn it off or I'm going to go with someone else. So that's what I meant by liquidity, uh, liquidity point and uh, matching demand and supply. Yeah. When you when you were saying that you you try to move them and go as much as possible, uh, what kind of experiment did you run in that specific delivery uh, talk you were telling? If you can share that. Right. Um, because I, I kind of figure out how people right. want to go very hard to start offering the services to a small percentage of your users. Right. But that it would be super difficult for an operation what it is. So right. I, I'm not sure how much of that I can answer. Just sorry. Uh, so I guess the question was, what were the experiments that uh, we ran to move the needle on, uh, on say for example, delivery, like increasing delivery on Yelp? Um, I'm not sure how much of that I can get into because I'm being recorded. Um, I'm happy to talk about this offline as well. Uh, let me see if I can if I can talk about something as an abstract. So. Search engines have been really good at one thing so far, which is, hey, you come with an intent, and then we try and satisfy the intent as much as we can. We're really good at this point in recognizing that we satisfy intent in one way or the other. You know, talk about Google, Facebook, Bing, even and, and Yelp. Um, what it's the harder problem is you come in with an intent, and then we basically try make you um, use the same search engine for different intents. Right, so which is what I was talking, alluding to in my in my earlier statement. People came to Yelp for one specific intent. They want a restaurant. They want a restaurant. I'm going out tonight. I want to find which restaurant to go to. I'm going to use Yelp. Right? How do we change that intent from okay, you're not going out tonight. You just want food, but we we still want you to use Yelp. And the the biggest levers there were awareness and consideration. Like we, we first basically try to understand how many of our users were actually aware of these features and then what, you know, basically we tried a bunch of different things to move awareness and then the next step for that is consideration. Okay, you now know that Yelp offers delivery. How do we make sure that you come to Yelp or you consider Yelp as a first choice when you, when you have that intent? Um, some product marketing stuff like almost any of the marketing, product marketing stuff, and messaging in the product marketing stuff, and positioning of your product marketing. Uh, I think those are fairly important pieces that you want to keep in the back of your head when you come across these problems. Does that, does that help? Yeah. yeah. Maybe one thing you guys can do, um, sorry, uh, is maybe when you, when you ask the question, just call it, say, your name, just so that other people understand who you are. So. Awesome. One of the questions that I had is, uh, how do you know that the set of experiments that you're designing mm -hmm. is enough to say that this is the feature that you have to add or remove uh, for that uh, particular product? So how do you know, how are you satisfied with the results of the experiment? Okay, so I'm going to abstract some meaning from the, some uh, a different question from your question, and then I'll try to answer your question as well. Um, the, the way I, w I would think about um, an experiment is it's a test of a hypothesis. 
Uh, the way I grade myself as a PM in terms of execution is how quickly can I get from a, a thesis in which I have some confidence based on intuition or some half of it, you know, half, half data, uh, to like testing that thesis. Uh, I try and disconnect the experiment with the shippable experience as much as I can. Um, meaning, uh, all I want to know with that experiment is that there's, it's a reliable way for me to say that this works or this does not work. It doesn't necessarily need to be shippable. I, go, I can go back to the drawing board knowing that this worked, and if I want to put more resources on it, more design work on it, more engineers on it, I'm, I always have the option. All I need to know is point A to point B, this works, right? Um, so with that in mind, I think it's very, it depends on what you're working on, obviously. If it's, if it's something that's going to impact uh, a thing like a marketplace where you're going to in, impact supply, who are, there's a lot of inertia behind uh, changing things on the restaurant side. It's, it's, restaurants tend to be very operational heavy. So if you change something, they would know uh, and they would complain. So I, I'll, I'll be careful to pull, pull, you know, uh, rein in the amount of uh, um, changes or loudness to the change that I have. But if it's not something um, restaurant heavy or that might cost a lot of uh, you know, impact on, on the supply side, I'm okay being a little bit more loose and extra. Uh, is, is that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, and this is like actually a question I'm writing here now. So um, when you have like, I guess, a hypothesis, and you already run a lot of user tests, and if the users are saying, oh, it's a good to have feature, mm -hmm. uh, we would probably use it if you roll it out. But you don't have a very strong conviction for it. So I think I'm in that phase of like trying to understand, should I do this, should I prototype it and test it out, or should I just send an idea? Right. If you're kind of in this phase of like, I mean, I think you kind of answered your question and prototype it. Um, if it's not very expensive, I know that's easy to say. It's not very if it's not very expensive. Again, a lot of the times users may not. You know, I didn't know what Snapchat was or why anyone would use it when it came out. You know, even when all of my friends told me what it was about, I still couldn't get it. Um, a lot of the users that you might talk to come across might not really know what they want and what they need. Um, it is, the, the problem is hard because they came back and told you that it's good to have instead of this is a must have, right? So if there's, you have a strong enough intuition that this is going to work, or if you can't find other data, and if it's cheap enough to build a prototype, I think that's your, that should be a next step. Yeah, uh, hello, uh, my name is Arjun, and I have a question with regards to the delivery feature you're talking about. Okay. How do you know how many features should add to the app that does not shift the focus of the app or to the customer coming in uh, thinking of going to a restaurant and instead getting distracted by that is a very good question, and unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you because that's a question we struggle with for a very long time. How extreme is too extreme? Um, it's I don't I don't have a great answer to that. I think it's it's very uh, instance specific, where you try out certain things. And then you watch, watch, wait and watch what happens. Or you basically talk to people. Like I said, prototyping is, is actually very, very useful here. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 you, you just have to, in some of these cases, you have to follow your instincts and say, okay, I'm not really changing, taking away the crux of what Yelp used to be by just doing these things. Um, and if you are, then you just take off the um, I mean, if, if it doesn't align with your company's initiatives, if there's not, I don't see anything wrong with backtracking. Uh, there's, you know, this, this one-way door versus two-way doors, right? Um, certain things like, you know, the adding the delivery feature or making the de delivery a louder piece offering from Yelp uh, was not a one-way feature. We could, things constantly change. Um, you'd be surprised what we think as like change, like you know, changes in the fundamental use of an of an app. The best use case I can think of outside of Yelp is Facebook. Uh, if you open up the More tab, I, I know someone here works at Facebook, but uh, you know, does anyone else here work at Facebook? 
Okay, I can talk about Facebook now. Uh, <laughs> if you open up the More tab, you find a graveyard of all the things that they've tried out and uh, may not have worked as well as the others. Uh, so it's, they, you know, you basically develop a playbook and see, you know, which is getting to the point of where, you know, it's loud enough, but it's not like taking away the usefulness of the app. Uh, and then you test it out. And you'd be very surprised as to how, uh, how much leeway you actually have there. Okay. Yeah, go for it, please. I have more of like a general question. Sure. It's very interesting you brought up the upcoming of product management as a profession, as a function right. in an organization. So what if what are the benefits? What what how was the rising of you know product management as a function in organizations, especially like in startups versus in like larger companies? Right. And what's the future? Is like, especially in the tech industry, how does this function work hand-in-hand with engineering team, with design, with Right. So there's a, um, again, I think there are two answers to that question. Um, let me let me start with a quick background. Again, it's my own perception of this of this, this question. So uh, if you when you, if you look at large companies like uh, Chevron or um, you know Toyota they actually have these strategy teams, right? These are people who think about strategy of the company and they work with these different departments and say, hey, here's what our vision should be, here's what we need to invest in. But if you look at tech companies, especially the newer ones, you don't have that people. You have an inner circle of people, but they usually tend to be product, or somehow related to product management or product marketing. I think that's what the future is, basically, we, when you start off as a product manager, you, you, what you're worried about, what you spend your time thinking about is like, how do I tactically make something work? Get it from point A to point B. How do I make you know, like this product more successful? But when you're trying to make that happen, what, in reality what happens is that you're basically setting the strategy uh, or the roadmap for the entire company, right? Um, so I think like a more conscious definition of like, okay, product teams, our product managers are basically the strategy visionaries of that company is where I think we're gonna uh, go towards. Product ma product management plus biz ops to some extent, I think play that role today. Um, and, and the second part of your question was more along like, how do you work with engineers? If yeah, I... yeah, it's interesting, you brought, you brought like, you mentioned that product manager kind of plays this role of like a off right. And historically, or in the past, like people who go into those professions are either, you know, MBAs, and then right. like uh, with years of right. um, in one area and became um, strategists right. for certain business. How, but like for product managers, it seems like it's a little bit of a different path, path right? Or Because, like, I'm just thinking for a company, why would I hire someone who has not had a lot of experience? Experience. With this area? Like a subject matter expert versus person, someone who's generic. So the, um, I can answer this question too from, from my personal experience. A lot of the people that I worked with who are really good product managers or rising stars to say, uh, they were not subject matter experts, but they did have one common thing. Uh, they didn't define their roles, they didn't box themselves into this is exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, they were really, really good at learning uh, and they just made things happen. So um, the way I look at uh, 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 as a product manager in a team or a company is that these are people who basically look at the team holistically, figure out what the team needs and play that role. That could be, you know, hey, we don't have a product marketing person um, you know, and the team is weak because of that, and that person goes in and plays the product marketing person's role, or tries to figure out how to get a product marketing person over there. So it's that, you know, the oil in the engine, so to say. Um, and that's how I would look at when I'm thinking about, hey, hiring a, a product person to add to an org or to a team, that's, that's the angle I would take. Does that, that answer your question? Right. 
Right, right. That's uh, that is a good question. Um, the reality is that you, you don't typically have all the data. If, if you have all the data and it's all of the decisions or data driven decisions, you basically don't need meetings at all. Like you just, you know, emails would would do. Uh, reality is we don't. We actually work off of like com like a large amounts of incomplete data. Uh, and those points, if, if that's that's the area that you're in, if that's the area the company is working in, then you need some sort of subject matter expert who have the right intuition. For example, on the search side, I would think you, the team would work better if you had a lot of subject matter experts because they know what's possible and they know that they're always, you know, the data that they need to make decisions are always are usually never available to them because they're trying and plan out for things two or three years in advance. Um, but on other things, perhaps on the internal tools, perhaps if you have internal customers on the extreme end, uh, you have most of the data available, you have a paradise list, you don't necessarily need um, uh, someone with that subject matter expertise to work there. In those cases, I think product management is not as, as useful. I feel like I'm, I may be answering your question, maybe not. Right, we can, <laughs> we can talk about it later. Yeah. I'm Lexi, I'm a, I'm a product manager for a 20 person startup um, in San Francisco. So I was wondering, you know, I feel like in a marketplace, startup and a company that has the formula down, so they know how to figure out, you know, on demand and supply, everything is really right. fine. Um, how important is to keep both sides being worked from the same team? Like, do you separate the teams into demand and supply because right. they are so close together? Right. Or do you kind of, you know, keep them? Um, my my take on that would be I think there's there's uh, there are people in the opposite camp. I'm in the camp of like try to keep them together as long as you can. Yeah. There's going to be a point where that falls apart, uh, but you want them to work as a team. At the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter how many users, new users you add, or the metric you want is not the new user growth or the supply growth. It's a liquidity point growth. Yeah. How important are you to that to that business? How important are you to those users? And to get to the liquidity point metric, you need those two things to work really well together. Uh, we, uh, in bigger companies, we tend to have a lot of process around this to make sure that these two teams are working together because usually supply tends to be sales and then demand tends to be product or product marketing. Um, so, and, and you do see that, that, that uh, adding that, that loss in linkage reduces the efficiency or the speed of actually getting to that liquidity point. So my take on that would be like, as for as long as you can, yeah. Have you guys ever pushed something on the supply on demand side that has completely pissed off the other end, you know? I feel like as a user of Yelp, I would love to go on there and look at the worst food at a restaurant, but you know, pictures of like a selection, right. I'm like, worst food, just to laugh at it, you know? Right. But clearly that's not gonna happen, because right. you're gonna go to the restaurant right away, right? Right. Um, so have you ever done anything else you can share with us? Um, we haven't, Necessarily try pissing off <laughs> restaurants. Um, um, I mean, there are, like restaurants care about obviously supply, uh, obviously demand, and um, changes in ranking. You know, they don't show up in the top ten results. Um, they're mad. They're angry. They talk to the you know the sales folks. Hey, why is my restaurant not showing up? And then um, that is usually how when this happens. Um, I, there's not a lot of instances where we. There's, there's a lot of uh, headbutting, right? Uh, there is there is some um, lack in coherent strategy, meaning supply. So when you're running a sales team, you comp the sales team, meaning you pay the sales team based off of how many restaurants you get on the platform. And uh, the incentive there is to go after the easiest, lowest hanging fruit. If I was a salesperson, you told me you're going to pay me 100 bucks for per restaurant, I'm going to go after the easiest ones. Uh, they might not be what we need for that liquidity to happen. You might have a lot of demand in San Francisco, but if you're going to go find me restaurants in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's not going to be very fruitful. So there's friction there. That's the kind of headbutting I've seen as opposed to like, you know, do, making changes here and there. That's cool. All right, I'll go with you and then you can walk our way down. Um, so I'm basically an engineer sort of exploring product management. Right. Um, so let's forgive me if my question sounds naive. But um, so my question is that um, so product management 
Um, it seems like the role that way includes with interactions with different like entities in an organization. Right. And I would think it also like defers by the organization. Right. Uh, the role itself. So um, when you're sort of looking for a product manager job, um, how do you know that the entity is perfect? Would you consider work? Would you go to bed thinking about the problem space? Sure. I think that's a very good test. If you think you can go to bed thinking about the problem space, wake up thinking about the problem space. I think it's a great test. Like I said, the way I mean, at least I view it again, very personal opinion, is that you 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 don't have a defined role. I think product manager is one of the the, the the least defined roles, and I think it should be least if the you know not defined because you don't want to box yourself in. And you want to play the role that's going to make your team more effective. And the only way you're going to be okay, you know, looking through a spreadsheet of thousand, you know, like rows, and then moving things around, is if you really, really want to work in the problem space. So that's how that would be my internal filter. Uh, I'll go. <laughs> um, I think you said that you're given your experience in the space. I mean, product manager means a lot of different things to different companies depending right. on where it is in its life cycle and where it is in the marketplace. And so any questions or tools you developed in an interview to really suss out what the decision making process is like and the true expectations and the way that you'll have to meet those. Right. I think um, you know, a couple of things that I would the internal test questions would be like how do they set goals? Um, the product again, they're the positives to both top down, bottoms up. The space that I've been very comfortable working with is bottoms up, uh, where the people closest to the problem get uh, the ability to think about the problem, like take a step back, think about the problem, and then propose, here's where we need to go. Uh, that's usually a sign that you're going to be playing a larger role in that company. Again, this is from my personal experience. There could be companies out there where top-down works really well, um, but that's, you, you know, the simple question if you're interviewing with someone would be like, how do you set your OKRs? Okay, if they come back with, oh, we have these guidelines, we need to hit like, you know, 1% sessions per UU for the year, and then we have this roadmap laid out, that means your role is going to be more tactical as opposed to being more strategic. Yeah. So you had a question? Yeah, go for it. Hi, I'm Bhagra. I'm also in Duke University. And my question is uh, that a product manager plays the role of introducing a new product, but how about a product manager who is actually trying to keep a successful product at its position? Mm -hmm. We're talking about something like commoditization, like for example, Fitbit, if that has attained its market, now what next for it? Mm -hmm. How do you continue it to be a successful product that users continue using it? Right. That's a hard question. <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. The question. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the question was uh, for a product like Fitbit, where uh, the maturity of the product has been reached, and uh, you're basically at the brink of commoditization of the mar of the of the product. How do you make sure you're still the market leader? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I wish I could answer that question. I don't think they figured it out yet. Um, <laughs> my default answer would be like, make sure you're you're innovating faster than others. I mean, there are certain things you can do to make sure you have enough raw materials uh, to be better and faster than the others. Is one of one thing I actually keep thinking about is, uh, you know, if you had a team of people. Um, are you faster than other? Like it's actually very important. You may not have the right idea, but operationally, are you faster than the other people? Can you actually, you know, change directions quicker? That's going to give you some advantage. It still doesn't solve that problem of like how do you prevent commoditization. I think that's mostly a you know a business question, which I don't think I could answer. Um, but but you could, there are certain things you could do to make sure you have more advantages by making sure operationally you're faster. And better than the other companies.
Right. So how did you balance keeping the um, The way I look at it is like I'm at a poker game. I've got $100 to bet. How much am I willing to bet on, the, on these different hands that I have? Um, some of it is by doing these tests. You know, that's one of the reasons why getting from point A, okay, I have a thesis to point B, okay, this is starting to work as quickly as you can is very important. Um, and so the way we, I would test um, is, you know, maybe I invest like a dollar to see if that hypothesis works. Maybe it's, it's, it's a two-person team, if it's important enough. Um, The, the, the test, you know, I, I care less about the, the experiments that run on the product. The test I would want to run is can Yelp be known? If you can answer this question, can Yelp be known for as a delivery app, right? There are multiple ways for testing it. You could, you could go change things in the app and then test it. You could run a Facebook ad campaign. The question was, why do, why do you want Yelp to be known for delivery? I see. Right. The question becomes, that question, okay, I know I get what you're trying to say. The, that question becomes easier if you had the opportunity analysis done and you're confident about that opportunity analysis. The, the reason why we chose to bet on that as much as we did is because when we evaluated it, we thought that this was a huge opportunity and it worked in our favor and it's in our space. So we could confidently make that case, I'm willing to bet $10 instead of one for a year to see if it works. If it works, we're going to double down, so which we did. Comparative like market sizing. Comparative market sizing. Um, we, we, yeah, we, we try to see. So another thing that I know I see a lot of my new PMs that don't do and a lot of teams in tech don't do is they don't look at competitors at all. We form strategies based off of here's what we've been doing and here's where we think we're going to be in three years. That's just pure operational roadmap. You want to, to look at your competitors, see where they're going to be, and if you think you have an advantage in-house, that's going to take you further ahead than they're going to be. And for, for a big investment like $150 million, you, you definitely want to go through that exercise before you, you pay that out. Right. Yeah. So, Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll pick you guys next. <laughs> to continue on that question. Right. Uh, so you talk about the opportunity analysis and why you would change the product's uh, direction, right? Right. So don't you think that the vision of the product, or that is always a constant, that cannot be changed irrespective of the so Yelp vision is always the same. Right. And the solution is basically you will evolve that solution so that you, know, you get to that vision. You cannot, if users are looking for restaurant options for them to choose a good restaurant, you cannot change that. Right. Right. So. So we were not. At this point, um, you're, you're talking about opportunity analysis and how do you connect that. To I think you hit the nail on the head. We don't try. So we we define what their core mission is, and we try and stay true to that mission. Our mission is to try and connect people to the best local businesses in whatever way, shape, or form. Whether it's through the app using reviews, whether it's through food, whether it's making reservations, any form. Right? Maybe it's at some point in the future that we'd be we have a concierge service. I'm not saying that we're building that. We're, at some point, maybe we might, but it still would uh, work towards that that core mission, and that never changed. This is one thing that I think you know your your leadership team needs to be very good about, and I, and thankfully for us, uh, they've been very very good about that. But you're right. Yeah. Maybe if you give me an example and uh, make it less abstract, I can help with that. This, is, I think, sounds like a really good, interesting question. Yeah. Right. 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 
can't even take it perfectly. Right. I think for that to happen, you need to have the luxury of being able to do that. If you're a 10-person startup, you're never going to do that. You're not going to care about what the five years outcome is going to be. You're going to care, you're, you're going to care about existential, you're, you have existential problems, you're going to care about that. If you're bigger companies, I, I, I think that you can actually do that where you take longer term bets. There are a bunch of frameworks you can actually use to think about all of these things and then make sure that you're, like I said, you know, betting a percentage of what you have every year towards those things. A lot of the companies that I've seen, even you know, big ones like Facebook, have had better luck buying out those companies. There's one, com- one team in your company that's always thinking about that, which is your biz dev team. Buying out companies, that has worked out tremendously well for them, right? For the, uh, even Oracle, for that matter, has done a pretty good job with that. Um, so if you have a big company, I think you can align that by, you know, by creating these small tiger teams, like I like to call them tiger teams, that go after a specific purpose. Some, team, some companies actually have these innovation teams inside uh, each org that go and build out and test out different things. Uh, the problem with those approaches is that when you hit an economic downturn, the first team that gets defunded are those teams, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not long-term sustainable. Like you see the cycle of them being like there for four years and then the, the head of that team just changes the job after the four years and you know what happened. The team got defunded. Um, the, the things that I've seen work are basically actually in, in these big companies that are going out and buying out uh, these, new, these new startups. Uh, there's one interesting, um, uh, we have a really great uh, 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 biz dev uh, person uh, and one thing he, he uh, always calls out is that, uh, you know, the future is already here. It's not evenly distributed. You've not seen it. I might have seen it, but, you know, it's already here. And that's why my job is very, very important. I'm going to try and make sure we actually get a piece of the pie on the future. So I don't think I answered your question, but I think <laughs> hopefully it gives, you, it gives you a different angle at it. Let's start off with the first hand there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Retention, I think, is the name of the game. End of the day. Um, I think when you're a small company, you're starting up. Uh, you know, growth and growth hacking is probably going to give you that boost and that you know that hockey stick graph that you can measure for the next twelve months. Uh, then after that, it's almost purely a retention, uh, a retention problem. Uh, th- what I really found is that there's no hacky way to bring in retention. We've seen this in different shapes and forms. Um, the, my, the best answer is actually for you to build the best product out there uh, for retention. Um, there are certain things you can do, like you know, if you pull out any you know, MBA book or any marketing book, they're going to say, hey, marketing, incentives, uh, like there's some tactical things that you can do to help boost retention. Um, so there, there are playbooks there you can actually use to, to move up retention. In terms of engagement, I think the one thing that, uh, that I struggle with is, you know, some companies define this aha moment, right? Like uh, uh, I think there was this one public thing that Facebook has, like, you know, seven, I think seven sessions in the first week or something, or seven friends are adding a bunch of friends for seven days will make you retain better. Trying to get to that spot is, um, is going to be helpful, but it's also easier said than done. For most complex products, that's not obvious. And even if that's obvious, it's usually not the complete picture. And just doing that is not going to help you uh, retain people better. Um, the, things that we wor- so, uh, the things that worked really well for us um, is actually understanding the picture and then knowing where the problems are. Okay, we, you know, we're adding you know, 100 people every month by new installs. We're churning or you know, 30 day inactives are actually growing by 200 per month. Then let's focus on that. And then just making sure we're focusing on those right problems. And it's very, surprisingly, not a lot of teams actually do that. They don't understand. They look at MAU growth and they probably look at 30 day retention or seven day retention. And then like, oh wow, this is pretty good. It's not bad. Retention is staying flat, and then our M- our MAU growth is going up. 
So I think we're all good, and we're going to keep focusing on the easier problems, the lower hanging fruits, per se. Um, but yeah, like I said, going back to an earlier point, I don't think you can hack your way around retention. Maybe over short-term retention, you can do by doing some marketing tactics. <clears throat> I'll go to the back guys first, uh, since they've been hanging for a long time. Yeah. Right. And more specifically, do you want to share something related to Yelp? Um, I know your product by the nature of it, I'm sure you use it for a lot of machine learning. Right. Um, so you can think maybe any other product um, or team that's using already AI or ML. And yeah. Um, so AI, uh, as it's known today, or neural nets, uh, as we engineers know it, um, is has taken over, I think, more on the media side than, than actually in the product side. Uh, of, of, uh, there's some awesome technological breakthroughs that have happened recently, very recently, that make these real life usable. One area where we use it uh, publicly is uh, the photo classification piece, trying to understand when you submit a photo, whether it's like the inside, whether what kind of dish it is, and um, whether it's, it's describing an ambiance of the place. So trying to understand the photos because so um, there are a couple of problems with AI. So let me actually start off there, and then actually talk about where we can actually we think we can we're going to use it in the future. Is it's very hard to understand when you are starting to solve a problem using any sort of machine learning uh, model. Uh, you want to be able to describe, find what's wrong with your model, your prediction, and then be able to correct it. If you ever looked at a neural net's uh, you know decision process, it's super complex. It's really, really complex. It's actually in, to some to the extent that's uh, that it's not human readable. So it starts out there. So you need to have a well-defined problem space where you don't necessarily need to debug the model quite as much, but just be able to like add more um, uh, training data to it, training and testing data to it. So it kind of limits the problem space where we use it today to to, to those well-defined problems. Um, so which is why photos is where we started. But I can totally easily see it becoming the de facto model that we use for search, all of search, all of recommendation engine, recommendation engines. Uh, the good thing about AI is that you know I can actually just throw an AI like a like a neural net model at you forever, and it's going to constantly keep learning about you without me changing the optimization functions uh, for you. It's just going to understand what it is that you like, what it is that you don't like, and then just work for you. The improvements that have made it actually much more usable today is that how fast it can do it. Uh, we were talking to this uh, to this new AI company, which basically looks at videos, and then in less than five seconds, it just analyzes what are, what everything is there on the in the video, and then basically starts tagging things uh, as they come up on the screen. So that was not possible a few years ago, three to four years ago. So I feel like, so it's going to just enable different places where you can start using these kind of complicated machine learning models. Yeah. So I have a question about the phone notes and how Yelp was able to get out integration with all the stuff very quickly. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Maybe the first one. Pokemon Go, right on. four days, less than four days. So from the start of ideation to getting it out was less than four days. Thankfully, it aligned with our uh, app release cycle, so that worked out. Um, I think the truth is we had that the team that worked on it was just a really good team. Uh, the PM identified it as a fun feature uh, that's not going to last forever. Some some of these, uh, these features usually have a cyclical life cycle, right? And if you don't get it before it's the peak, it's not useful. So there was a hard constraint. Either we do it this week or the next week, or we just don't do it at all. 
Um, so identifying it was basically based on intuition. It's like, hey, this sounds like something, you know, it's picking up a lot of uh, this uh, Niantic uh, Pokemon Go picked up a lot of uh, heat, uh, good heat. So let's just capitalize on that a little bit and then help our users um, um, find uh, Pokemon Go stops uh, in these restaurants. Um, yeah, I think the answer is, you know, we just had a, you know, we had a well-oiled execution machine on that team that was able to pick it up, thought of a good idea, got it approved, and then was able to run with it and then ship it out in four days. The other thing that contributes to that is also our approval process. It was our approval process. One of the, the good things about having a small-ish team, we're not super small anymore, but we're small-ish, is that um, we depend on people rather than process. That shortens the life cycles for these kinds of decisions by a lot, right? Um, uh, um, Will, who worked on that, was a PM on that product, would have w just walked up to people and said, hey, I want to ship this thing. Do you think it's okay? Done. So that, that helps quite a bit. I want to go there and then I can come back to you guys. Yeah. Right. And how do you prioritize which to focus on and which features to develop for like which um, user group to focus on? Um, it depends on what we're trying to do. If we're trying to get people who churn out to come back, then we will focus on those user segments. Um, we, I think I might be overgeneralizing what I'm saying right now, but I think we try and be very targeted in terms of what it is that we're trying to do. If we are trying to get people, say for example, we're working on bookmarks, we are trying to actually get people to do more bookmarks, and if there's a segment of people who don't do bookmarks, then that's usually the segment we target uh, our development to, right? So I think these are basically in the opportunity analysis, the step that you do before you figure out what else, what are all the levers you can pull on, you try and identify those people, and then you try and identify this, the segments of people you want to go after for each of the features. Yeah. You told upon this a little bit. Um, you're working on startups, many at large. Right. Um, can you talk about being a PM in Right. I, I was at Microsoft, large-ish, larger company. Um, so uh, being a PM in a small company is very hard, right? I think you, <laughs> you can probably, because one, the, there's always a lot, lot of things to do and you have enough, you have more, more things to do than you have resources to do. So, you, you know, you're the amount of, uh, um, prior, you know, you, the amount of prioritization you're going to do is going to be brutal there. Um, you always know that you could be, you know, product could be much better. You always know you could be doing a much better job. Um, so in that sense, it's a sigh of relief. Uh, having the ability to, to throw money at the problem, when I was, I was talking about Microsoft, and throw money at the problem, uh, than me spend, uh, you know, 18 hour days every single day and still feel like I'm underperforming because my product's not as good. Um, so in that sense, it's a sigh of relief working at a bigger company. Uh, obviously, the smaller the company, the more autonom autonomous you, you can be and, and uh, more of an impact that you'd have. At a mid-level, mid-sized company like Yelp, um, you know, we're, I think we're about less than 500 people in the engineering product put together. Um, it's, um, you, you get, I, I feel like you get the best of both. Um, but there are downsides to it as well, which is, uh, you know, your processes are not set up really well. So you, 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 you're some of the things that don't necessarily are not necessarily thought about uh, in a small company carry over. For example, um, we didn't have period growth levels for a long time. You know, it was it was like we all knew who was doing really well, what they need to improve on. Like it was a small, very small team. You can basically count the number of people. Um, uh, in, in your hands uh, when we started out and for a long time we actually stayed in that that spot and <clears throat> so things like that are not well oiled uh, in a smaller company um, but I, I per personally tr would trade that um, for working in a smaller company than, than go to a bigger company yeah yeah 
curious, you know, a lot of attention is paid on, you know, academic you know, numbers, you know, engineering side. But right. I'd like to get your perspective on more of, you know, what are like the personal attributes, what's the emotional intelligence that makes a good PM? Because, you know, part of your job is you're protecting your engineers, right. you're making the business case for the business to invest in your priorities. And right. Talking through, like, the idea of, you know, what are the big things that you look for that you've seen as successful? Right. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been asked this question a lot, like, what is it that you need to have? And in my eyes, I think there's only one thing, one skill set that you need to have, which is like making things happen. And uh, that's like encompasses a whole lot of things, right? Um, I think that's where like communication, all those things fall in. The way I think about a product manager is you're not the coach for the team. You're basically the QB for the team. Uh, yes, you want to protect your engineers, but at the end of the day, you're the person managing ideas and you're the person managing the success of the product. If that's going to piss off your team for the next three months, my opinion is that go for it. That's fine. If you think that's the right thing to do, uh, if you think they're going to quit, if you did that, then don't do it. Um, but it, it boils down to that, you know, for me, what I take, uh, what I pay a lot of attention to is that is that person has that person shown tenacity to go do things that other people would actually shy away from or seemingly impossible things. A lot of the times I see uh, people have constraints. Everybody's got constraints. Every, every work team, I've got constraints, right? Um, every, every work team that you worked at would, you know, would have constraints on you. And how those people have gone past those constraints, I think that basically up levels that person in my eyes. Does that, is, I think a short answer for your question. Please. I do. For newer people, I do. Um, and I also think from time to time, I go this, go through this, I go back and revisit it. Um, I call it the 90 day cycle. For a new person that comes in, has never done a PM, try to get one big win that's going to increase. End of the day, you're a product manager. People need to trust you, right? Because again, a lot, you're not going to have enough data in the world to convince everybody. Uh, so people need to trust you. So the first 90 days, try to get a big win. Show them that you are you can actually get things done and help them actually get things done. And then try to scale that up. Okay, how many of those things can you get done in the next 90 days? Is it one to three to, I don't know, six? And then you, you know, as you grow through your career levels, you try and do the same things with the different people that you have on the team. Everybody's got different working styles. And how do you get them to do something very similar? So try out one thing, tune it down, and then scale it up. Um, that's what I've, you know, a, a rule of thumb is what that's uh, that's what I've used uh, for my teams. Just to clarify, so that last lesson is once you get good at executing multiple things, you help other people get. Right. If you if you manage other people, or if you get the chance to mentor other people, that's what I would focus on. Um, yeah. You don't, so when you're managing a lot of things and you're juggling a lot of things, you don't get the chance to be, to hone down your playbook for executing one single thing. That's why I think it's very important to actually have the time and focus to get better at that executing one specific thing. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I, that's the first thing. Every, uh, even product managers, TPMs that we get, uh, I'm trying to make sure that for the first 90 days, they're actually focusing on execution getting that nailed down, then maybe scale up, and then maybe help the team do the same as well. Really All right. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'm wondering, if you mentioned a moment ago that you're talking about uh, how it can be downside of, you know, shooting in the I'm wondering, do you have like a strategy for making the, um, the fallout of shooting down people's ideas and the code, or, you know, just do our ideas? Yeah, it's like, hey, it's just not feasible. Right. I think um, tactically, yes. Uh, I believe what you're talking about is like, hey, you know, all my engineers came up with these ideas. I feel bad saying no to them. Is, is that it? Uh, it's how you do your brainstorming is very important in that way. Um, setting clear expectations that this is not necessarily a consensus-driven um, uh, exercise um, is actually very good. Like, yeah, no, no matter what meeting I walk into, the one thing I, it's clear in my head is like who the decision maker is. It doesn't necessarily need to be me, but at least I know who the decision maker is. I'll make sure my viewpoint gets heard. Maybe I'll fight for it. But at the end of the day, everyone in the room will know whose decision it is. Like making that clear would remove, or at least not remove, reduce the amount of emotional anxiety 
that trying to bring in consensus and dropping things out of that exercise would cost. And then how you do the brainstorming actually makes a huge uh, difference. There's this, uh, you know, if you, uh, this is like a widely popular um, uh, business school idea, which is like, hey, you try to diverge and then you try to converge, right? So by definition, you're dropping off ideas to converge. So uh, like doing tactical things like that. So, so basically what I mean by that is, say you walk into a room, you basically ask people to come up with, you know, 50 ideas for a problem, problem space, and then you ask them to start refining. You, you do that as an exercise with that team. So people start realizing that, you know, reducing the number of things you work on is going to happen, as a matter of fact. And then you take back, you know, from, from a list of 100, you, you, you take back a list of 20, and you will it down a list of three. Right, so they, the, setting that expectation again uh, is going to be very helpful in, this, in those cases. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Michael from New Australia. Um, so I have a quick question about data. Um, right. I'm looking at kind of testing out the season data testing. Right. Uh, a quick question about how do you know how much data is enough and when do you say, you know, that's fine, I can say that this is a good, no, this is a group, this is a group. Right. Uh, there's a statistical significance test. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Uh, like, what, what kind of methods do you use? I mean, you basically need you have you have you you can tell how many what the sample size needs to be for you to actually be statistically significant uh, for a specific result. Mm -hmm. As long as you know what metrics you're going to be measuring ahead of time, it's actually it's just a you can just plug in some numbers and you get that. Okay. Is is that what you're asking me, or maybe I'm missing yeah, something? No, that's, that's, um, yeah, that is. I'm just just gonna follow up on that. Um, right. What about how, how do you kind of manage that in a low data environment? So I work, I work in B two B. Right. Right. I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to be a, you know, data, so data is another tool that you have in your test, right? It doesn't need to be purely an A-B test. I feel like we default to that as engineers um, for some of us, but it doesn't need to be the only answer. You could do other things. You can go talk to them. We do surveys and we value that as much. When we were in Bing, we used this, this, this big metric called side by side, which was not necessarily, I mean, Bing, like Microsoft had this nailed down, like data was everything, you know, like we had a huge team there that built out dashboards, beautiful dashboards that were consistent and people trusted it as much, but still the big metric was not even, you know, that the data metric we had was a qualitative metric that we got from, from people. So maybe you, there are other channels for you to get that data as opposed to just an A-B experiment. Cool.